In today's video, we discuss intermittent fasting and optimizing muscle growth. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Paul Ravella from ProPhysique.com and today we're with Stephen Bogrand. Hey guys, hey y'all. Science with Steve. So uh, for those that don't know, Stephen also has a YouTube channel which I'll link below. But today's topic is going to be about intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting. So what is the fuss with intermittent fasting? Uh, so essentially you are taking your feeding window from all day where you don't really have any kind of... Uh, set up for it and say if I'm hungry I'm gonna eat cool um, to a set window of time and a lot of people I see are doing eight hour feeding windows but I've seen people do as low as two hour feeding windows uh, right. for the day before as well and so it can do some things with your fasting blood glucose insulin sensitivity and some other things uh, for a lot of people it's really good for just controlling overall calorie intake sure, as well absolutely uh, so it can do a lot of things in terms of lifestyle as well to kind of help out with maybe some health markers and other things that you're having issues with or maybe having issues with um, but again like I said it's just been really popular with the inquiries I've been getting in lately yeah and I, I like the idea of intermittent fasting I like the idea of controlling calories when it comes to fat loss and improving body composition and improving any things like insulin sensitivity, yeah. it helps to have a set of rules to follow where you kind of just set it up and you follow. And I think that's where the, the big benefit of intermittent fasting is. And, and in fact, I did a video series last year where I did some intermittent fasting. And what I found was it was nice to not have to think about things during certain times of day. Oh yeah. I absolutely. knew I was not eating until 11 a.m. Yeah, for sure. I woke up and just started my day. Yeah. So, you know, you don't think of it that much, but Oftentimes, eating can kind of interfere with your kind of workflow, your life flow. Stopping to eat all the time can become um, kind of cumbersome. And then also, if you're trying to lose weight, it's a good way to control calories. Yes. Setting up a time to stop eating and start eating is a good way to kind of control calories. But what we're going to discuss today is not amongst the general population. We're going to talk about people that want to be elite athletes, that are, that are interested in the kind of maybe science behind intermittent fasting. If there is any magic to it. Or is there a benefit to doing an intermittent fasting approach if your goal is to kind of optimize your physique as far as muscularity, uh, performance? So with that said, let's start with the idea behind eating multiple times per day when it comes to protein synthesis. Yes. So when we talk about protein synthesis, we're talking about the body building new muscle and in this case, nutritionally. So when we eat complete proteins, full amino acid profiles, if we have enough and typically enough leucine being the big one, um, we tell our body nutritionally, hey, let's build more muscle. Let's rebuild current muscle. Um, so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have protein spaced out evenly over the day. and. For me, I like maybe four protein feedings a day, but some people go, like to go as high as five. Yeah. Um, now, what this does is it satiates something called the refractory period. And essentially what that's saying is we break protein down into amino acids. They go into the bloodstream. Once those blood amino acid levels rise, that's when muscle protein synthesis happens. But we need those blood amino acid levels to go back down to normal levels. Uh, before we can spike it again. They actually IV'd straight amino acids into somebody for eight hours straight. And what they saw was spike, and it still had to come back down before yeah. it spiked again. So that's why we kind of want a little bit of timing in between those protein feedings so that we can keep building and rebuilding muscle. So when the refractory period is at, what, two and a half, three hours, I think is, is about an estimate. Three right? hours is the minimum that I've seen. So this is where we can run into problems when people eat every two hours, which was yes. actually a protocol that was in muscle magazines, you know, from, from years ago. Um, and then we can also run into a problem where when we fast, potentially we're missing out on a few opportunities to, prep, to, to spike that muscle protein synthesis. Correct. Because we got to sleep. Right. Um, and if you're if you're if you're only eating in an eight-hour window and you need a three-hour refractory period, right. you might only be able to get three solid feedings in that window. Right. Um, and some of the fasting protocols, you know, the 16-8, I think that's probably the most common one. Correct. Um, so is there a benefit to adding that fourth meal in where you're getting some extra protein? Yeah, absolutely. Especially we're talking about <clears throat> high-level elite athletes and physique competitors, right? Yeah. That's a lot of what we deal with. I'm very high level. <laughs> I didn't laugh at that. Anyways, so we're talking about the consistency over years and years and years. Yes. Right? So if we're missing it maybe one day a week or a day sure. every other week, whatever it might be, 
probably not going to be any kind of big deal in the grand scheme of things. But when we're talking about absolutely maximizing our potential, being the best we can possibly be, uh, the best recovery, the best performance, um, and the most muscularity for us, um, then yes, absolutely, over time, an extra muscle protein synthesis spike or muscle building spike um, over years and years or a lifetime even absolutely can make a difference. Yeah, I think what we're talking about here is not what's the what can we get away with and still look good right we're looking at the people that are interested in optimizing every single day for their goals every single opportunity that they can improve um, not people that are trying to make excuses to eat junk food not right. people that are missing workouts or you know just trying to stay in a good position we're talking about what is the best thing that we can possibly do to make sure that we are the best we can possibly be. Not everybody wants that, and we're not we're not suggesting that everybody should follow that. Right. I think what, what Stephen and I, the approach we take with our clients is, you know, we might even have some people take a fasting approach when calories get low and hunger becomes an issue because that's the priority. But for the, for the most part, our goal is going to be to get in as many protein meals as we can during a period while we're awake to make sure we're moving forward towards that goal of building muscle getting stronger and getting better over a period of time. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah, and you said we want to talk a little bit about uh, the magic of intermittent fasting and body composition. So right? I think there is an association where, you know, now there's this trend on the internet where, you know, it's not, it's not a caloric deficit that makes fat loss happen. It's all hormones. And so fasting has been associated with some positive hormonal changes. So there's this association with fasting that magically makes our hormones improve fat loss. So let's address that idea. Yeah, absolutely. So end of the day, and I know it's a very oversimplified thing, uh, we're looking at a calorie deficit. Now, can hormones affect, you know, metabolic rate? Yes, absolutely. Low testosterone, lower muscle mass, lower calories burned at rest throughout the day. Yes. Higher cortisol, maybe. Right. Higher cortisol, poor recovery, right? We're not recovering well. We're having poor training sessions, stress. So yes, hormones absolutely play a part. They play a role. So at the end of the day, we want to be looking at calorie deficit. Um, for people who are really trying to get to lean levels of body fat, that might mean some aggressive stuff. That might mean a low calorie approach. That might mean a lot of cardio, a lot of output. Um, hormones are still going to affect that. Yes, absolutely. Insulin sensitivity is going to be a thing. Cortisol is going to be a thing. But making sure that we're managing those as best possible helps to make sure and ensure that we are still in that deficit. So at the end of the day, calorie deficit is our end all be all, even though there are a lot of other yeah. things that can affect that calorie deficit goal. Yeah. So. You know, the most important thing is that you're taking an approach that fits your lifestyle. You know, for, for us, I, I tried the fasting uh, approach and it was simply too difficult for me to get my required protein in for the day in that eight hour window because I'm well over 200 pounds. So, you know, that may come down to how much protein you're eating in a given day. If you are a 100 pound person and you only need to get around 100 grams of protein a day, three meals might be sufficient. Right. Okay. Whereas when I'm eating close to 250 grams of protein a day, you know, it's not comfortable for me to eat 80 to 90 grams of protein in a city. Okay. So when it comes to how much, and this is the next question that everyone's going to ask, how much protein can your body absorb when you eat it? Right. So the misconception is that it's like what, 30 grams of protein is what your body right. can absorb? That's that you max it out. The rest is just a waste. So the truth behind that is, is 30 grams is typically enough pretty much for any body type to happen. It's like muscle building, muscle protein synthesis, right? So that's where that 30 grams come from. Your body can still break down, absorb, and send protein through the system to change it into glucose on top of that. Um, so the idea that we don't necessarily like absorb protein, yes, we definitely and most certainly absorb protein. Does it take more energy for our body to change, change it into glucose? Yes, absolutely. Is it harder? Yeah, absolutely. Does it necessarily want to do it the same? Not, not yeah. quite. But the, there's definitely that misconception of we can only absorb. Muscle protein synthesis, once it's triggered, that's its thing, it's doing it. Yeah. So in that aspect, you don't need to have more than 30 grams of protein probably per sitting, um, unless you're a giant, a giant <laughs> behemoth of a man. Hot floor needs more. Watching you, Brian Shaw. Um, <laughs> he's gonna outangle me again. Always. <sighs> Anyways, uh, but yes, you absolutely can still take that protein and utilize it as energy 
uh, within the GI tract, even if it's over like the 30 gram. Well, and like Steven said, it takes a lot of energy to break it down. And actually, protein has the highest level of satiety of all the macronutrients. So when you eat protein, you feel fuller. So having more protein than you might need to spike protein synthesis can actually be a benefit. And it's, a, it's an approach that we use. Yes. Food volume is, is an important consideration. So, well, that's going to be it for today. We're going to discuss uh, intermittent fasting. I think that's enough of it. What we'd like from you is to know if there's anything more specific we could address on this topic or if we should just shut the hell up and do something else next time. Um, go check out Steven's channel and we'll talk to you guys tomorrow.